Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Peter Van Doren, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of Regulation Magazine. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Peter. Thanks again for having me. Now, holding my hand, hot off the press is an Onion article from 2000, of which the title it's is... It's not hot off the press. Yes, it's, it's off the printing the printer, at least. And the title is, 98% of U.S. commuters favor public transportation for others. What does that say about public transportation politics? Well, oddly enough, um, well, maybe not oddly, The Onion, right, finds the truth and then tells it to us in a satirical way. And in this particular case, uh, they're actually quite right. Um, I'll I'll shift ahead to some data. Um, So there's surveys every year of... of, uh, the habits, the transportation habits of U.S. citizens or U.S. residents in the Trump era. I don't know whether they're citizens <laughs> or residents, but anyway, there's a Department of Transportation survey and they ask people, um, how do you get to work? And I have in 1989, drive self, right? Then there's ride with others, which I didn't include, but drive self was 76.3% in 1989. 2016, guess what? 76.2%. No, 76.3. Oh, wow. It's exact, that's, it's, that's pretty amazing. It's, it's, it's exactly the same. So what does all the money we spend on transit do? It allows most people to still drive themselves to work. Now, when did you first get involved with public transportation policy? 41 years ago. I was – I had – so I graduated from MIT in 1977, and the summer of 1977, I spent as a research assistant for a professor named Alan Altshuler, and he had a contract with the Department of Transportation to write a classic MIT consulting report uh, on the urban transportation system. They wanted a big think, big piece to talk about. Um, transit and cars and the environment and cars versus transit and energy and uh, congestion and all of those things rolled into one. Uh, He submitted the report to the – well, I – my task was to read everything out there on energy. And one reason I did energy – in my PhD program later was because I started out in 1977 reading a lot of books on energy and I said, this is interesting. But this experience with Alan Altshuler also also got me interested in urban transportation and in my scholarly career before Cato, I taught courses on urban policy analysis for 20 years and a component of that class was always a transportation component. And it got started with this summer research experience in 1977. So one of the interesting things you notice when you look at articles about public transit or calls for more public transit is public transit can mean a whole lot of things, right? I mean any vehicle you can hop on that's not yours and it will take you where you want to go is public transit um, if it's run by the state. but. When we see, you know, we need to spend, we need to ramp up money, we need to put more infrastructure in, they don't mean things like buses. They never mean things like buses. They mean things like light rail, light rail, trains, things that you, I mean, first have the the effect that you have to figure out exactly where they're going to go, and then they're going to go in exactly that spot forever and ever till the end of time, unless you want to dig another tunnel under Washington D.C. or whatever. And and buses, buses not only get kind of excluded, but buses are like looked down upon. It's you know that's they're, they're the cheap seats. Uh, we we wouldn't want more buses. What's going on there? Like why why do we seem so fixated on on trains on things with obviously much higher infrastructure costs and so on? Well, two things. One in this book, or well, let me continue. The DOT consulting project uh, that Alan L. Schuler and his team uh, wrote and then submitted to the DOT. Uh, was so down on transit uh, subsidies and expenditures that – and in this book, the call was if you're going to do something, what makes sense is buses. Buses are flexible. Buses are cheap. 
uh, light rail, heavy rail are capital intensive, very costly to to build and to maintain, and uh, not very flexible. Once the route is is there, you can't. It's hard to move <laughs> train tracks, and so even way back then, the the intellectual position was that if anything makes sense in de- in, in denser settings to get people out of cars, it's to do something to aid buses, i.e. dedicated lanes where they don't have stoplights or they have stoplights that are sequenced and they get to where people want to go faster and they're flexible and they can be rerouted. So, A, what you talk about is old and and all transportation scholars have called for such options a long time ago. But B, the politics and the social reality of transit is that Middle class people who pay taxes think of buses as something for poor people, and no one wants to talk about that. Um, I'll give you even uh, where I live, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, which I affectionately call the People's Republic of Montgomery County. It's very, very liberal and uh, is known nationwide as being a transit leader and a um, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, where urban planning density is required, all of those, all of those things in the liberal land use playbook are epitomized by Montgomery County. And yet, in my own county, this is an article from 2009 in the Washington Post. Council, Montgomery County, council also picks light rail over buses for transitway project. So this is the Corridor City's transitway. This is up county where I live to link upper, upper county with denser parts of middle county. I mean, closer to D.C. parts. Yes. Yeah. Um, light rail for the Corridor City's transit way on a route that would begin at Shady Grove, swing west to the proposed Science City, north to the ComSat building near Clarksburg, would cost about $900 million to build, about twice that of a bus rapid transit line. Okay. So, And the county council staff recommended to the council that they have a bus plan rather than light rail. Now I'm reading you a quote from Michael Knapp, D, Up County, i.e. he was my representative on the county council at the time. And this is a quote, Montgomery County, Maryland. I've not had a lot of conversation with folks who want to get on a bus, no matter what you call it, whether it is a pretty bus or not, said council member Michael Knapp, who represents much of the area the transitway would serve. He said his constituents expect light rail. So, it, it, I mean, there you go. It, it, so, was the conclusion of the study, which was done for DOT uh, buses, yay buses all the way, or maybe buses? Oh, totally buses. But I mean, I mean, I mean that buses if, should if, be subsidized a lot, or but or, or just if you're going to do it, you should do buses. If you're, I'd have to go back and check the exact language. I mean, the the sort of libertarian concerns. Uh, that we're now discussing and animate our discussion certainly weren't part of my world back in 1977, nor in Alan Altshuler's world probably ever. Um, so I, I rather than misquote what the book does or doesn't talk for, it's just that my memory is that we adamantly said, um, you know, heavy rail is very expensive, make, make sense maybe only in Manhattan. And that's, and that's, if it makes sense somewhere, it would be the New York City context. Uh, and everywhere else, um, buses, because they're flexible, they can change, they can you can adapt to whatever reality happens. And then the problem is they're buses and middle class people. They, I mean, my own view is they go to Europe, they see the trams in Amsterdam, and they come back and they say, and they read The New Yorker, like I do, and they say, we, we got to have trams and look like Amsterdam. I mean, to to be honest, I think it might be as simple as that. And it's very class-related, i.e., the help rides the bus. We, we don't. I wonder if that's now exacerbated by the changing cultural place of cars in America because there was – so there was a time when – you know, everyone you, you aspired to have a car. A car was a symbol of freedom. Um, a car was the kind of quintessential American object after maybe a baseball. Uh, but that has changed quite a lot. So y- younger people, you know, are less likely to drive or have less interest in driving 
or uh, and and the car is the car is kind of now seen as this thing we have to figure out how to get rid of because it's the source of global warming of congestion of traffic noise of fatalities of whatever else and so a bus a bus is simply a bigger car right so even if a bus doesn't doesn't have some of these same problems even if it's better than trains in all sorts of ways it still is kind of admitting defeat in in the crusade against the automobile Two, th- one, there certainly has been a discussion in the literature of whether auto behavior and autos in U.S. culture have changed. There was a decrease for the first time ever. There was a decrease in vehicle miles traveled after the Great Recession. And urbanists and pro or pro-transit and anti-car uh, people and environmentalists and young p- – and there was this proclamation that – the U.S. has changed. We've gotten over the hump and we're now going towards Amsterdam. Uh, everyone's going to have bikes and trams and blah, blah, blah. It, trying to disentangle the Great Recession from actual changes in goals, which would – if people's incomes got back – so subsequently, the VMT has come back and as I gave you new data, the transit share has not – Changed uh, well, it's gone up a little, but driving self ha- has is remarkably constant over time. The breakdown by age is is not available in the transportation statistics. So, dry, dry, I don't think I, I could be wrong, but I don't know of data where driving self by age is is available. It may be, but I'm I'm not aware of that. So, the uh, anecdotally, uh, I have a nephew who. Uh, lives in Seattle and quote was reluctant to own a car. He didn't care about it. And I said, "What do you mean?" You know. So I guess we all may have younger nieces and nephews in which the alleged change um, exists. But in the aggregate data about the U.S. as a whole, it still seems very auto based. And um, I don't have enough information to know whether this youth trend is or is not was recession induced or whether it's actually um, going to sustain itself as they enter middle age. I'll just as as further anecdotal data. So my my father worked for 35 years in the auto industry as a for General Motors and retired a few years ago. And and towards the end of his career, we would talk about the state of this stuff. One of the things he mentioned is that a all of the the auto industries, one of the, the big problems that they had was figuring out how to market to young people because they were all concerned and whether this was borne out in the numbers or just kind of a, a gut feeling that this was the direction they would go, that young people were not interested in buying new cars anymore. You know, what? That, that if they if they got a car, they they were perfectly happy to buy. This was more just like a commodity. You know, I just I, not, not cool anymore. Not cool. I can buy a used car. I don't really care about you know the, the kind of American graffiti lifestyle is gone, and so they were trying to figure out how to. I mean, basically how to market like new General Motors cars to millennials, and were very worried about this. I think that I saw a stat. I'm pretty sure this is correct. That in, I think in the last 15 years, so 15 years ago, 90 percent of people over 16 or over driving age had a driver's license, and now it's 75 percent of people. And I know a fair amount of people who do not have driver's licenses who are in their early 20s, for example. Now, we live in an urban world, so that makes a big difference. There's a certain D.C., New York flavor to this conversation. And if we were in Phoenix, I I don't (laughs) – I I really – I mean, I think it's – it's it's possible in certain – in Seattle, in San Francisco, D.C., and New York, and Boston, it's certainly possible – to live and not have a car. I mean, even back when, I didn't have a car till I was 30, 31, something like that, because I was in academia and lived in college towns and you can wander around by bike or, you know, whatever. But um, outside of those locales, um, it's, I suspect that what we're talking about is is not true. I also wonder about the um, so you said that the you know the kind of number of miles driven per person has not decreased. 
Right. The, the number people, of people driving. The number of people driving or the number alone of Alone to commute. Yeah. The percentage. But I think, I think you'd mentioned something else about like total number of passenger, passenger miles. miles. Well, that's an, I didn't mention that data yet. Okay. But, but I, so but I, I, could, can. I wonder if there's also that the, the people who – I mean I know that this is the case for me. Like when I first came to D.C., um, my family has a car but I never drive. Um, my kids are actually always – astonished when I do drive and they'll tell their mom like if I drive them somewhere like when mom gets home they'll tell their mom that dad drove them and they always say it in this way that like and can you believe we're not dead <laughs> sort of way but but so I didn't drive much at all and so I took a lot of public transit but then over the last 5 6 years I personally don't drive but my Uber driver does a lot and that still is counting as and so I wonder how much of public transit time has shifted in these urban areas and especially in D.C., New York, San Francisco, back to cars but in the form of ride sharing? I did not. I can look. It's hard to I'm say. I'm not prepared. I, I can look up the data. Um, actually, we could we could supplement it, put it up on the on the website associated with the broadcast. Um, I am. Uh, but I think it's important that that puts it in a context of all all alternate ways of commuting, alternate things to do that have come up to into existence, Uber, the scooters that are everywhere in DC, that that metro ridership has the metro ridership has been going down. You have the numbers for DC, I think, on how many people commute via car versus metro. Well, even in DC, again, the the transit use is very, very associated not with actually total population density, but with downtown employment. Transit is good at getting people from dispersed areas to one central place. If that's not the design of the urban area, then it's of very little use. So D.C. is a large employer. It's called the federal government. And a lot of those jobs are downtown. And yet in D.C., you'd think, I mean, just off the, I'll ask you guys, what do you think the percent of commuters in the Washington, D.C. area, right? That's the whole metro area that use transit. What percent of work commutation occurs by transit? 27 percent. 50 percent. It's 14. That's okay. astounding. It's only 14. It's just – it's – How does that – how much does that shift? So we, we're like – the D.C. metro area is very large. And, and it gets it kind of gets more spread out on the periphery, and the jobs get more spread out. So if you took just, you know, the area around like downtown, obviously, downtown. right? As you get further and further in, the percentage of commuters that are transit increases, and as you get further and further out, it decreases. Um, if such data, you know, and you were going to ask me inside the Beltway, inside the city limits, I, I don't know um, the. But I've always been stunned by. Uh, again, it's the concentration of downtown employment, which is very high in D.C. relative to other, other cities. And yet, um, just listen to WTOP every day and listen to traffic. Um, it's despite the 700,000 people a day who use Metro, uh, that is a small percentage of the 5 million people in D.C., a lot of whom commute from lots of places to downtown. Um by, by car. I like to get step back. So going back to your your study when when you're a grad student, uh, it was for the Department of Transportation, but you they refused the report. By the way, they wouldn't accept it. It was so contrary because it went against everything they wanted to do. Um, so it ended up being published as an MIT press book in 1979. Well, it was this but, radical libertarian it, position, correct? Well, not it was just. It was. It may seem that way to us now, but at the time, um, and certainly my whole career um, in in this area, there's been a distinct difference between what transit and transportation intellectuals say when they appraise the system, regardless of their political affiliations. In that Brookings and Cato and AEI and all, I mean, Alan Altshuler, very straightforward, straight ahead classic bureaucracy, political scientist, public administration sort of person who taught at MIT and then the Kennedy School at Harvard, uh, not flaming libertarian enclaves of by any means, that the transportation intellectual consensus over time 
was that transportation subsidies for transit probably made little sense. And yet, transit, actual transit transportation behavior over time by the political system and which is responding to constituents has been totally the opposite. I mean, I th- the, you can rank order policy areas as to how large the difference is between what intellectuals think about what policy should be in an area and what policy is. My number one area for discrepancy is agriculture policy, where the overwhelming elite consensus is that agriculture subsidies are totally, totally unnecessary, particularly now that we have um, uh, markets, futures markets for everything farmers grow, and thus they can hedge and and do whatever they want to ensure themselves against price swings. Um, the second area, and my second worst compliance between what or difference between what intellectuals think and what policy really is, maybe urban transportation, um, in which uh, light rail and heavy rail and transportation subsidies are politically desirable and favored by constituents, as I described in the quote about Montgomery County. And the consensus, I mean, Cliff Winston at Brookings wrote a book 20 years ago that called for the end that well, U.S. consumer welfare would be enhanced if mass transit subsidies were uh, go, go to zero and we became a much more auto-based system and then transit would endogenously arise and be priced at whatever it took to relieve congestion, which is what it, it might be very useful for that. But um, in the absence of congestion pricing on the roads, you also – wouldn't get that. Um, so quite frankly, what intellectuals call for is zero transportation subsidies, but congestion pricing. And better pricing on that Better side. pricing on on roads, and which would reduce their use at peak time, which would in turn change where and why people live where they do and change their work patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So we're back to Econ 101, which is we need good prices for stuff rather than subsidies for certain things that are seen as good because the other thing that isn't subsidized is somehow evil. You said that transit really only works when you have a area of dense jobs and people going into and then out of that area. And and so we're talking, you know, dense urban centers. And then it doesn't work well in any other situation like, you know, people moving around in the suburbs well, or Phoenix. <laughs> so my question then is does political support for transit track that? So do people who live in the suburbs or live in Phoenix um, and the politicians who represent them, are they less keen on transit than the people who live in these urban centers or imagine that they do? I'll, I'll, give, you, um, I'll give you an answer to that question that may not directly address what, what you say, which is originally mass transit subsidies at the federal level they all went, or half of them, it all went to New York City and Chicago. That So 1970, Urban Mass Transit Administration, um, so-called UMTA grants, all, it was New York City and Chicago. Well, that's not an equilibrium in Congress. Mm-hmm. It's You've got to, I mean, so what's happened over time is transit subsidies now go everywhere. And so my little, that the city near where I grew up in northern New York, Watertown, New York, 25,000 people, uh, now has a bus system, <laughs> and the buses go around from nowhere to nowhere, and no one's on them. And so, over time, if you look at the productivity of transit employees, so you look passenger miles per transit employee in the United States, it's just a steep curve linearly going down. And the reason is at the margin, what mass transit subsidies have done is expanded mass transit to less and less dense settings, i.e. Watertown and Phoenix, because politically, if you're going to have a a federal subsidy system, it can't just go to where it might be economically efficient. It has to go everywhere or where it's politically efficient. And so Martin Walks, who teaches urban planning at USC, he's now emeritus. I used to use an article in my class written by him in Science Magazine that said, it just documented all these trends I'm talking about, which is 
transit expansion went after middle class voters in the suburbs to gain political support, and that meant in effect, declining productivity and increasing inefficiency because transit was going in settings where it wasn't very useful because those places were automobile based and could be easily and thus buses kind of run around empty without anybody in them using diesel fuel and and capital expenditures. Okay. But then so someone who is a fan of transit in the on-rails sense of it uh, might say that all sounds great and yeah, like setting up new light rail tracks might not be the most economically efficient thing and adding more buses might be more efficient or you know, expanding driving but having congestion pricing and so on might be more economically efficient. But cars are – cars and buses, they're burning – the buses are burning that diesel fuel. They're all contributing to global warming. The environment matters and rail, even if it looks inefficient on paper, is zero emission. Um, it's, it's, so it's better, it's better for, from an environmental standpoint, which is a – I guess a longer term perspective. Well, it, we're, we're looking ahead. It actually depends on the source, how the electricity is generated. So until recently, um, this mid-Atlantic region, the dirty little secret is new, we had much cheaper power prices than New England and New York. And um, Maryland and Virginia and, and D.C. always touted, you know, we're in the Northeast and it's allegedly anti-business all that. But Long Island electricity prices are outrageous, 15 cents a kilowatt hour, 17 cents a kilowatt hour. And Maryland is eight. Well, you know why? We had coal. Proximity. So half, half of, until recently, just the past few years. Do you mean coal is closer to no, Maryland or the, just they used half coal? Of, half of electricity <clears throat> in the PEPCO uh, electricity system, I know because twice a year the electricity bill has to send out an emissions report to every customer. And so you all threw them away. I read them. <laughs> and, of course. <laughs> and this is why and, Peter's our favorite guest. <laughs> Uh, it's all, I always was amazed that in this liberal, right, in Maryland and D.C., liberal, 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 et cetera, half the electricity comes from coal-fired power plants. And so electricity was cheap here because we burned coal. So when you went on the metro you were and used electricity, you were burning coal. And that doesn't even include the and, energy when you when they built it, which also can be a lot of fossil fuel. If, oh. you're, if you're running earth movers around that are running on diesel fuel and shipping in rails and all that stuff. In the book I talked about earlier, the Alan Altshuler Urban Transportation System book, um, there were calculations done in the book about whether the construction of BART in San Francisco, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, the energy used to construct BART, if you assume that it actually saves energy operating relative to cars and makes some assumptions and how how full the cars were and how empty pass, you know, if you rig it, you still came out with it would take a it, it might never ever recover the energy used to build BART because it's under it's it's very expensive and energy intensive to bore tunnels. Um, but but it's also I mean it would also be expensive to you know you want to get okay we want to let people drive into DC to it, instead of the routes that they're taking on the metro you're going to have to there's no highways that run through DC putting a highway through is going to kick up a lot of stuff into the atmosphere as well so how does it compare to building, building road. roads uh th again the book I didn't read that part of the book. Uh, it's been 41 we, years. Yes. <laughs> Come on, Peter. <laughs> recall off the top of your head. I don't. Not that I would be surprised. I don't <laughs> want to misstate what the the book had a long discussion about total life cycle costs of transit versus highways and things like that. And and so I think there are answers to your questions out there. And again, I'd have to go dig a lot more to to, to figure out. Well, it have it would have to be if you're not digging tunnels into the earth. I mean, maybe if you build the the big dig in Boston, cost about as much as uh, that was, as a as a metro line. But most highways, you just that was a put big them deal. On top. That the, was a huge. The deal. Boston thing was a big. Never would have happened without federal subsidies, and those wouldn't have happened without Tip O'Neill being Speaker of the House. So, <laughs> I mean it. That's the Tip O'Neill 
subsidy to Boston was the big dig. I forget how many billion dollars. I can't even remember and how uh, much longer and how many overruns. But but this is a good segue to go in to – Talk about highways in the city and all this stuff. Going back, we we had discussed earlier before we went on air about the evolution of these transit subsidies, how they came about, and you pointed out Nixon to some degree. But it, well, it, I, it, I think people again, particularly for our younger listeners, uh, the reason that transit has no intellectual or transit subsidies have very little intellectual support, but but great political support has to do with the '60s and the riots. And Nixon. And um, I'll read you a quote from the book. Um, And I'd forgotten this quote. This is uh, page, oh, I don't have the page, page 36 of the Alan Altshuler book. So uh, Altshuler's explanation of why, in his estimation, even though transit makes no sense from an economic point of view, why is it so popular? And the answer was as follows. Whether one's concern was the economic vitality of cities, protecting the environment, um, stopping highways, energy conservation, assisting the elderly and handicapped and the poor, or, as the Onion article said, simply – and I'm inserting that. That wasn't in this book. (laughs) Or simply getting people off the road so I can drive faster. (laughs) Transit was a policy that would be embraced. That is – It wasn't that transit was actually an effective way of serving any of those objectives. It's simply that everyone believed that it would be so. And that's politics, right? So transit was the Republican answer for what to do about cities that were burning without bringing up race. And particularly since highways, the urban interstates were the last to be completed in the system. And they were expensive and they were always associated with slum removal. And black neighborhoods resisted. They said, why why are you knocking down cheap housing for us when this road is going to serve white commuters who aren't don't even live here? So in Boston and in D.C. So, you know, the um, is it 395, right, that, that stops yeah. right down here from Cato? Mm-hmm. That was supposed to be I-95 through D.C. Oh, cut right through the middle of the city. Right through, right? And then there were protests. And so they stopped. In Boston, if you take 95 from the Tobin Bridge down and you have that big left-hand turn in the middle of the air and you go next to Boston Garden, if you look to your right – there's this exit that goes off into the air and then stops. And again, people don't realize there was going to be an interstate between MIT and Harvard, right through central Cambridge, going by, right by the BU Bridge, right by Fenway Park, and then through Roxbury, and then hooking up with 9395 south of in, in, in the south end of Boston. There were protests. There were – and – the governor of Massachusetts at the time was an MIT graduate, and Alan Altshuler was the Secretary of Transportation for Massachusetts. And so Alan Altshuler invented the solution, which was the urban interstate highway trade-in, which is if a governor asserted that we needed to, to, to not build these highways that were part of the interstate system, we could convert that money into mass transit projects. And Altshuler says... This was a decentralized conflict. Congress could reassemble the coalition that was for transportation. The anti-highway protests would stop because if you didn't want it, you could get your subsidy and do something else with it. And the rest is history. I mean, it it was a – so mass transit spending grew the most under President Nixon. It it was a – political solution to a series of conflicts that makes no intellectual sense, but it makes perfect political sense. And it got got rid of all the conflict from a congressional point of view and put it back at the state level, which is what they wanted. So how did this look? I mean, the the New York City subway and and the Boston subway. I don't think the DC subway, but New York City and Boston predate these subsidies, these federal ones, correct? But expansion, right? So the Boston system, right? The red line of all these. So the D.C. expansion. So believe it or not, the red line that I ride, do you you ever wonder in D.C. why the other line stopped short of the beltway mostly and then the red line goes so much further out? Maryland traded in uh, interstate highway money and made the red line a lot longer. Um, 
and and, and it fits with the politics of Maryland. Uh, the reason the Orange Line historically stopped at the Beltway, and uh, and both ends, right, is that money was used by Maryland for the Red Line to extend it, uh, and again, interstate highway. So, feds like to spend money. It's popular, but this spending money in this way in certain constituencies led to hassles for those constituencies. So they said to the constituencies, "You can use your, you can use the money for other stuff." But New York City and, is private, right? The the subway. That's what I meant. But at one point, sort of. Um, initially, yes, but even after, but but by 1913, they were built with city capital money, but then operated and owned privately. So It's a hybrid. A hybrid model. Um, total conversion to the sort of MTA running everything is, is post-World War II. Uh, Boston, the system went bankrupt in 1905. <laughs> so, a privately created like hybrid a, system. A private, well, that was really private um, and that went bankrupt early. Um, there's in in both New York City and Boston, the subway systems were very much. Pro, uh, the proponents were real estate developers in the outer boroughs. Uh, Queens and Brooklyn were developed because subways allowed people to get there and get to work in Manhattan quickly. And real estate interests didn't want the fares to be high; they wanted the fares to be low, that so, so that people settled. And then once settlement occurred, then you could sort of have bankruptcy or subsidies because once you've got people using it, it's then unthinkable to sort of shut it off. Um, and you and I have had yeah. con conversations about how with certain public services, there's this long run game uh, in which it, it, you get, you we get enough interested parties uh, involved in it and – we get a very uncato like e equilibrium where lots of people have a vested interest in being subsidized, and even though it looked private to start with, it really wasn't sustainable um, given what they were charging uh, for the service. How do we address this then? I mean, and this this is a question that isn't limited just to transit, but transit now, as you've described, it seems to encapsulate all of these problems, which is you've got a policy or a service or subsidies or whatever else that, that comes in not because people who know about this stuff think it's a good idea but for purely political reasons um, that it then becomes popular because constituencies love subsidies or services or whatever else. It, it then in the case of transit becomes culturally embedded so that people come to see not just like a moral case for light rail in terms of the, you know, we're going to have environment, environmental effects, but also uh, there's there's like a, a status thing that your your city is on the map if it has light rail. Uh, and, and the politicians then, you get the cycle of now the politicians have to double down because it's a great way to fire up. Um, and so we're, we're spending all of this money. We've got this kind of obvious solution that is more effective, cheaper, potentially and more environmentally friendly, could service all of these people better, um, namely buses and they could be electric buses if we didn't want – we wanted to get rid of emissions. But – there's you've got the you've got the constituency you, you can't of, get there from here. Right. Like, so you've got you've got all of these people now and and cultural attitudes. Don't and forget beliefs, property owners. I mean, any, owners, any, anyone right. who has a property on a metro line, how much of their property value is related to that? All the businesses that are related to that. Sure. The stakeholders here get vast. Yeah. And so now we. So how do you get out of this? Is there any way to? Is this or do we just kind of say, well, <laughs> do we just have to give up? You can say yes. It's no, okay. I think we do. You you have just stated extremely eloquently all the properties that of what an economist used to describe an equilibrium, i.e. there are enormous forces that have got us to where we are. It started out as an accident. You have a Republican president in the 60s and the cities are blowing up and he's and the highway coalition's falling apart and he and his supporters have to figure out what in the heck are we going to do? His answer, subsidized transit. And it has worked like crazy in ways that – 
appall classic Republicans, probably, uh, unless they want to be reelected. <laughs> and you, so how do we? So getting from where we are now to the world that the Brookings scholars have described as optimal, that the Cato scholars have described as optimal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Extraordinarily difficult. And I don't know. I mean, that the so the intellectual in me agrees with you 100%. And I, there are no easy ways to get from what you describe to where we need to go. And in the end... Um, it's usually budget crises, budget constraints. And eventually, somebody somewhere is going to not want to pay the taxes that make this thing hum. But the same thing was true with ag, right? Ag. How, how? So you could say the same thing about agriculture subsidies. And guess what ag did? I mean, we had reform in ag, and then it all went away. And now it's gotten even worse because instead of explicit crop subsidies, we now have subsidized crop insurance. Well, that sounds much better to vote. I mean, who's against insurance? Yes, it's just ag subsidies dressed up in new clothing. So if you want to be very, very, very glum about things, think ag and maybe transit. Um, And uh, so, no, do I have any (laughs) great answers about how to get out of this? And the answer is... Um, I'll, I'll give you even a bigger puzzle. The silver line in D.C. Do you know what's paying for it? So this is a, a new expansion it's, of the metro for those of you. Who, okay, sorry, the, yes. yeah, the, those Americans for some reason live outside. The I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to say airport taxes, maybe. Well, there's some federal subsidies, but you know, a lot of what's paying for this silver line. Excess toll diversion from the Dulles Greenway, which is a private road. So we have a Cato-approved road, and it goes from Dulles to Leesburg. It's a private concession, but it's governed by Virginia. And so what Virginia has done is there's now a surtax on the tolls on the Dulles Greenway that's going to go up and up and up and up in the future. And I've been betting with myself, when are the motorists on this road going to understand that their tolls are not, even though it's private, are not just paying for the debt service on this road. The, all the toll increases that they're incurring now are going to subsidize the construction of the Silver Line. And you'd think some Loudoun County officials would say, enough, just stop, just we've had enough, right? Kind of a, a network. I've... For those of you, that's an old movie where some guy leads out the window. <laughs> I'm and mad as hell and I'm not going right. to take it anymore, yes. And, well, so eventually the cross-subsidy game that keeps all of this going, which is – and Randy O'Toole, our own scholar, has talked about the, gas, the diversion of gasoline taxes from roads to transit and bikeways and every other thing under, under God's green earth, Right. Do motorists understand that they're not only being taxed for the roads, but the taxes are being diverted to things they don't use? If motorists understand that, and I thought this Loudoun County thing would blow up, so far I've been wrong, right? The Post reports taxes are, or the tolls are going up because it's paying for the silver line and like crickets. I don't, I don't hear any motor at uh, AAA saying this is outrageous or something. No, so. But eventually, I think things like that, which is gas tax diversion, uh, what about they, will, will eventually get the, because the majority of people drive cars, right? Even in in DC. What about so. reliability? That's that the reliability of the metro system because it's just look what's happened in the last year. Um, the the what did the metro chief do? He played a big game of chicken with with Maryland and Virginia. And D.C. over what? Not we need more – not to make the users pay more. Instead it was, you know, it's a shame that that Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. are ponying up. And we needed a dedicated source of public revenue because all other transit systems have it. D.C. is the only one that's not. That's our problem. We don't have a dedicated source of revenue. 
the Republican governor of Maryland sort of reading the tea leaves kind of held up for a while. But then he realized, you know where all the voters are? They're not out in the eastern shore uh, where the chickens are grown. They're in <laughs> Montgomery County. And you know what? Those, they like their metro. And they want the purple line. So he caved and let the purple line go through, even though it's $1.4 billion. And it's going from nowhere to nowhere. And it took away a bike lane from all the people in Chevy Chase that love the old railroad path that was their little recreational trail. But he still did it because um, they're good at reading what wins elections. And my sense is this is going to go on until... I think it, it's diversion of the gas stuff will eventually um, – people will say, I thought I was paying for the roads. And, well, you sort of are, but we're taking a third of it and we're using it for things you don't believe in or use. And So is there an ultimate lesson here? This is we, – we might have said some uh, weird things to people listening today where you, you know, we say, oh, public transportation is an important thing. It's so great. I love it. How would people get from – South Brooklyn to Manhattan or how would people get from Arlington to D.C. or how would people get from Roxbury to downtown Boston or anywhere else? Um, what is the lesson that you generally should take away from the, how, how these public transportation, transportation systems arose and then or the, how about the a Or how about a meta policy? I mean, we could go above this. Was what unites ag and transit and all of this stuff? And the answer is politics is a combination of belief systems that justify things combined with uh, diffuse taxes on a lot of people redistributed to a much smaller set of people in a concentrated way. So the gas tax diversion is on a majority of transportation people are auto users and they don't know there's diversion and the gas taxes they don't may not even realize what they are and all that because they're embedded in the price. So small taxes on a lot of people diverted to purposes that also have philosophical or normative intense support. I, who could be against transit or against farmers or whatever? That's a, that's, that's a winning coalition and that's very sustainable over time until either the philosophy goes away and those people are now abhorrent for whatever reason. And I don't know how that, that's what sociologists and historians figure out. How do you go from being in to being stigmatized? And then two, um, eventually the, the, ta the, the, the group of people that are taxed somehow wake up and realize it. And there's some incident or something that, that causes a crisis in, in, this, in the political support of those taxpayers. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.